All right, everyone, I'm just seeing people uh, joining. I'm just going to give people another 10 seconds. There's still some coming in, and then we'll kick off uh, today's session. Welcome, everyone. Okay, we're looking like we're slowing down, so I may get started. Um, firstly, hello, welcome to today's uh, webinar hosted by the ATC. Uh, we're here today to discuss the incredibly hot topic of skills-based transformation. Um, we hope today the panel will discuss what it is, why it's important, but importantly, what's the impact it may have on the talent function and also the role of talent professionals. Uh, my name is Gareth Flynn. I'm the MD of TQ Solutions. Uh, we're a talent consultancy, and I'm spending a lot more time with customers trying to navigate this strategy and transition. So I'm fascinated by the topic, and I can't wait to hear from Claudine and Matt today. Before we kick off, though, and uh, bring in the speakers, I would first like to acknowledge uh, the Bunurong people, uh, who are the traditional custodians of the land and waters of the Mornington Peninsula, which is where I'm working from today. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, uh, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any First Nations participants today. Um, in light of the weekend, I think it's in incredibly important today, and um, I uh, thank you for uh, joining me in, in that acknowledgement. In the chat, can you please share where you're dialing in from today? And hey, Craig, I've seen you join as well. Uh, please let us know where you're dialing in from today. And uh, let's welcome our guests, Claudine and Matt. Please, please join me on screen. Good morning. Morning. Hey guys, how you doing? Um, we'll do a really quick intros to you both, and then we'll get we'll get stuck into some of the Q and A. Uh, Claudine, can I start with you? Do you want to just introduce yourself, uh, your role, and maybe a little bit about Grab for people that may not know Grab? Sure. So, hi everyone. Really, really excited to join you all in this conversation today. Um, I'm Claudine, so I lead employer branding, recruitment, marketing, and people comms for Grab. What is Grab? Um, Grab is uh, one of the most exciting companies I've ever been a part of. It was founded in 2012 with a real mission to drive Southeast Asia forward. But it's changed a lot in that time. So originally a ride hailing taxi uh, service. We now provide services from uh, deliveries, mobility to financial services and business services as well. So the transformation the company has gone through in that time is really where we're having this conversation today in terms of skills. Um, in terms of why this is important to me, we don't have all the answers. And I think, you know, these conversations are so f helpful for us as a community to learn from each other, support each other on this journey, which is complex. Um, and will take time for us to navigate through. And I'll come into a little bit of my personal journey later on as to why skills in particular are important to me. Fantastic. Thank you, Claudine. And uh, Matt, um, good morning. And do you want to do a quick similar intro as well? Good morning. Yes, thanks, Gareth. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Collins. Uh, I lead Beamery's Asia business. Um, my background has been pretty HR heavy. So prior to Beamery, uh, I was in HR and HR tech, um, starting well, far too many years ago now in talent acquisition. So with agencies like Michael Page, uh, Robert Walters across uh, various parts of Europe and Australia, uh, and then moving into HR technology. So started my HR tech journey with SAP Success Factors, um, and then moved to employee experience solutions with Leader Medallia uh, across wider Asia. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Beamery, so we were founded not dissimilar to, to Grab around 2014, with a real purpose and a mission to unlock the potential of every human on the planet. So we created uh, a platform that's built from the ground up on AI to man manage that entire talent life cycle. So giving clients the ability to deeply understand what skills their workforce has today, what skills they'll need tomorrow, and solving those challenges by helping you attract the best talent, finding skills gaps with better fit talent, uh, developing employees, and redeploying people to critical projects as well. Yeah, fantastic. I'm uh, really looking forward to this discussion. Um, some very familiar names on the uh, chat I've seen dialing in. So good morning to everyone that's joined. Um, just in terms of logistics, before we go into the questions, um, can we please use the chat for feedback, general discussion, a bit of banter potentially? Um, but can you please put specific questions that you want to ask the team in our Q&A using the Q&A uh, module in um, Zoom, uh, rather than putting lots of questions in the chat? That'll be fantastic. Claudine, my first question is really for you. Um, you know, my LinkedIn feed is just full of 
uh, skills and the need to move to skills world. My colleague Alice has just come back from HR tech and his summary was skills, 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 AI. That's the topic of the day. Um, why do you think this transition from the world of jobs to the world of skills is so important? So there's the personal answer for me, first of all, here. And if I look at how my career has evolved, and it seems like a long time ago I was at school, although perhaps it was kind of just like yesterday, but I had this dream and this vision of a very, very straight career path for me. I was going to train as a journalist, be a journalist, and that's all I was going to do. I graduated, and then immediately I was doing something different. I went into PR. Then I went into internal comms in my next role. Then I did a little bit of a hybrid role in terms of business development and marketing. And so for me, this is the key in terms of all of those roles were possible because of the core skills I had. It wasn't about the job title or the qualifications I had on paper. It really was even then, you know, 20 plus years ago looking at the the abilities I had and how I could then move across into different companies. But in terms of why now it's the it really is kind of the talking point for all of us. We've had a long time uh, about the skill shortage. Is that a reality? I'm going to be controversial here and say I don't think it is in a lot of areas. I think yeah. it's a it's a self-created issue that we have. And so in the role that I'm doing quite often you know, when we're looking at branding and we're looking at marketing for a long time, it's been, OK, we'll create campaigns for these exact job titles in these exact companies. And therefore, our addressable market is small and it's of our own doing. So really now, when we're looking at the some of the drivers that are coming in, you know, rapid technology development is the key one here. You know, everyone is a little bit fearful and uncertain around what does AI and automation, et cetera, mean. For me, they just enable us to work smarter. Mm. It enables us to lean in and do the, you know, the much more impactful work that actually I think is more satisfying for all of us. But technology is the key driver for us here. You know, then we look at things like career longevity. You know, with the Gen Zers coming through, they are hungry. They want to develop. They, you know, every six months they expect, you know, to be doing something different, having a greater impact developing themselves and so we've got almost this perfect storm start starting to brew the other thing is around flexibility and adaptability because I think for us especially post-pandemic where we all started to see there was a different way for us to work mm. you know that's where a lot of people you know even my perceptions and my needs and wants changed and I started to think about myself outside of the box that I had created and so you know for us the other driver is around inclusive hiring. So going back to that addressable market, you know, we all have been talking about DE&I for a long, long time. But again, that addressable market is small when we're only looking for what we know or what yeah. we've experienced before. So for us, skills really is around understanding the needs of the business. Every business, especially in the last 12 months, has had greater pressure than ever before to work smarter, to be leaner, to produce kind of better results for, for investors. And to do that, you've got to have the right people with the right skills at the right time. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, I love your comments about, I, I, I do tend to agree with you about the, um, are, we, are we suffering from a skills crisis or are we suffering from a, either an attraction crisis or a lack of knowledge crisis, <laughs> particularly around our workforce? We'll, I'm, I'm sure, unpack that a bit more today. Um, Matt, um, I'm, I'm, I'm boxing you in as the tech guy on this call, uh, apologies, um, but tech, Christine, I've already mentioned it's had a huge influence in making this possible. Um, you know, what are some of the latest developments in HR tech more broadly do you see that are enabling this transition to take place? What, what are some of the trends that you're seeing from a tech point of view? Yeah, look, I, I think so. And I mirror some of Claudine's sort of comments and sentiments. I know we've, we've discussed this sort of at length before, right? Um, Look, HR technology has taken a huge jump over the last few years, right? If you look at the progress that's happened with predictive analytics and AI and, you know, what seems like six months ago, generative AI, um, and the way that this is being applied for HR teams and employees, I think is really exciting, right? So specifically on the skills sort of comment and, and sort of train of thought there, it's been an absolute godsend. 
right? If you look at what AIs are really, really good at, it's taking in huge amounts of unstructured data, lots of different data types, and then looking for patterns and trying to apply different models, predictive models, et cetera, um, and doing that at scale really, really quickly. Um, that's great for understanding skills, right? Information on skills sits all over the place. It's not just a one sort of one-stop shop. You know, they're in LMS systems, in your core HR systems, ATSs, LinkedIn, CVs, the actual work you're doing in your job, right? And whether that be your full-time job or whether it be gigs and projects. For a human, for an HR professional or a manager or the individual employee, uh, to try and put that list of skills together for every employee would just be an absolute nightmare, uh, if it was possible at all. But even if it was, um, it would take so long that by the time you finish that, it's going to be outdated, it's going to be inaccurate, it's just not going to be an effective source of information to take action on, right? Um, so with AI, you're able to use predictive models to bring all of that together, all of those various different data sources in real time, um, and really assess what sort of skills that person is likely to have, right? You're able to refine that over time, either automatically, so using AI, manually through the employee, nominating what skills they've got, um, or nominated by things like managers and peers. So it becomes a really group source information that becomes really accurate and very, very fast. And I think that's allowing businesses to do something they weren't able to do before, which is gain a really clear picture of what skills they've got, what skills they don't have that perhaps they're going to need moving forward to do that in a fraction of the time, to do that at a fraction of the cost. And I think that becomes a really useful tool for CEOs, CFOs, COOs, hmm. when we talk about organizational planning, right? It becomes a much broader issue than, than just HR. Yeah, fantastic. And look, Matt, I concur, we're seeing technologies being the catalyst. We, we Humans couldn't do this before, or if they tried to, there'd be an army of people yeah. arguing mostly about uh, um, taxonomy uh, before they even started thinking about the individuals in the business. So um, it is enabling this this new strategy, which, uh, yeah, I, I'm really excited about where it's going to head. Um, the, the one question I kind of inserted in, in into the discussion today, I get the proposition for the business. You know, the business case for this is pretty self-evident. I, I look at you know, trust barom barometers, and I look at data privacy and people's skepticism about government and business and, um, you know, what's in it for the employee? You know, how, how are we going to get the employee to play? Um, I'd love to just get a bit of a perspective from both of you on that question. And uh, Claudine, I start with you. I love how you always come to me first. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, really, and, and this is at the essence of everything we all do. It's the what's in it for me element. And I think from, you know, if I put myself in the shoes of an employee, what is it I need and want? And for me, it is, it's helped me own my own career journey. Don't tell me what I should be doing or how I develop. Allow me the the capability to understand, and I think it goes back to Matt's previous point around, you know, what are those skills that I need to develop to get to the next role or take a completely different direction? Like, what what is it that my my learning journey should look like? And then how do I access that? So it is around ownership. The next piece then really is around loyalty. So that a big thing for me is around how do we win the renewal of our own employees every single day? Yeah. Because we know losing talent is actually a really expensive business, right? So trying to hire somebody new externally to fill those shoes that somebody who's been there maybe for a year, two years, three years and beyond, who knows the culture of the company, knows how to operate successfully and is really brilliant at their job, to lose them because mm -hmm. they didn't know what opportunity was there internally is a big loss for us. And so really, you know, how do we win that renewal? It is by showing them that there are there are several different paths and opportunities for them over the longer term and having that control, not feeling like somebody else is dictating that path for them over the longer term. Fantastic. I love the notion of agency uh, for the worker. It's um, yeah, great, great to see. And Matt, would you add anything different or, or um, anything else to that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, so Claudia and I are on, you know, 100 percent the same page here. Um, initially, you said what's in it for the employee and sort of separating that from the business. And I, I don't think in a well-oiled machine, 
you can do that, right? The business should be looking out for its employees, right? So, you know, one of the most recent examples, if you look at the, the tech rec, right? So all of the technology companies laying off tens of thousands of people and then manically trying to hire them back when they realize they can't keep the lights on without them. I think it's a really good example of where businesses have got it wrong, right? And I think having access to that visibility of what your what skills your employees have, where they want to go, um, how you can help fill those gaps is, is really important, not just from the business's perspective, but from the employee's perspective. Um, I imagine there's nothing more, I mean, you're an employer brand, um, Claudine, right? I imagine there's nothing more detrimental to that than having employees leave and then seeing a job role that they'd be perfect for or wanted in a couple of weeks afterwards. So, you know, I think from the employer's perspective, it's really crucial that you serve your employees correctly by understanding them, right? By doing them justice about where they want to go and is there a good fit for them in various different business changes that happen. But you're right, as an employee, having access and control over your own career path is really empowering, right? It's something that was pretty unfamiliar to me before Beamery, just having that ability to map out my own career path, to understand how to get there. Um, and not necessarily the job that you have and the job you think you want, but what other jobs are open to you based on your skill set, right? I think that's sometimes an unknown. If you look at really large organizations, do you want to be the manager and, and the, you know, the person above that and the person above that in what we would call sort of a traditional career ladder? You know, we're seeing a more of a career jungle gym, right? Where people are happy to go sideways, up, down, left and right uh, based on their interests. And I think that information is sometimes lost to the business, which means they're not able to deliver that to their employees, so I think that's a, a really crucial element to this is understanding where they want to go, showing them how to get there. Um, and that's not just around sort of learning and development, but other pieces around the connectivity of, of the people in the business. I think that's often can get lost when we talk about technology is how do we set people up with mentors? How do we coach them? How do we guide them? How do we set them up with gigs and projects and short term pieces of work that can help them get there faster or if there isn't a job for them in the next two years, like you said, Claudine, instead of losing them, they're able to get really in there and start doing gig work with some of these other business units that helps them feel that there's progression. Yeah, fantastic. I love, I love never heard Jungle Gym before, but I quite like that. So I'll, I'll just scribble that down for use later on. <laughs> um, yeah, Matt, Claudine, you both talked about, I'm actually going to pose a question for those on online for the chat. Um, there's something that's just interesting me. Um, Claudine, you've you moved um, careers uh, by the sound of your personal journey. I will admit to being an ex-accountant. I used to work for Deloitte as a graduate. Um, embarrassing, I know. I then moved into um, uh, recruitment, web streaming, outsourcing, and now run my own business. So I've moved careers lots. My question to the chat is, you're in talent roles currently. Have you got an unusual path to get there? How many of you have perhaps moved from a radically different profession into talent? If, I'm interested if, if any of you have that, made that move, please share it in the chat just as I go through this next question. Claudine, um, my colleague Nadine attended uh, the Energy Summit in Sydney last week and she was terrified when she came back because you know the challenges we're facing with energy transition and, and, and the skills crisis that that particular industry has got. Um, yeah, you know, she's she's really worried about it because everyone's talking about the, the problem, but no one's actually thinking about the talent solution. Mm -hmm. A build strategy is clearly important for sectors like energy, where we need to think about, you know, potentially some of the adjacent skills or foundational skills and then build the new skills that we need. You know, talk to me about how a skills transformation can support that build rather than buy strategy and, and if you're doing anything like that at grab i'd love to, just to hear a little bit more about it so we're really early days right and i think that the build strategy is so key for for all of us um especially in it's not just industry specific it's in certain countries as well where we know we're going to need skills and perhaps the the education hasn't been there to begin with so for us, it really starts with what that total talent view looks like. And that's the, the key is, and I say total talent because it's not just internal or external. And that's how we've operated previously is that they're very disparate entities. So we'll go, okay, we've got an open headcount here. Let's just go out to the market 
and try and find someone rather than looking internally. So looking at everything holistically is key. But it is also about understanding that future need. And I think for me, this is where working with the business, really understanding what the strategy is. So the key point for me is this isn't just a HR problem or a mm. TA problem. It's a total business challenge for all of us to come together. You know, it's not just something that TA goes and executes. It really is working as a as a wider team to really understand what those talent insights look like. And that's something that we're really doing a lot with the business at the moment at Grab. You know, whenever we do have that open head, it is looking internally first, like yeah. how, how can we help develop someone? You know, gigs is key. So starting to future proof our business. And I've even got it's someone on my team as an example. Um, she's absolutely fantastic. She's been in the team. She joined actually a week after I did. Um, and she's now doing a growth gig two days a week in a completely separate team at Grab. And she's loving it. So, you know, for her, the benefit is she she's getting that development and feeling like she's getting that growth. The benefit to me and Grab is that we're actually really investing in developing her. So there's, you know, in terms of succession planning, she can either grow within my team or go into another team in the future. So that build strategy is key, along with the talent insights and really starting to work with the business to break down these skills. And I want to touch upon a point as well that, that Matt made and kind of go off on a slight tangent. For me, the biggest challenge that we've always had is that we we look at somebody's resume. That's yeah. all we do. That's the person, whether it's internal or external. And that doesn't tell you the total sum of the person. Like, what are their capabilities? And for me, this is key in terms of starting to really understand what people are. And that's how technology enables us. So it's almost this perfect formula of business ownership at a strategy level for us to really workforce plan and then do that building element. But then having that technology piece really support us in terms of what that total talent view is. So we can best understand where the skills gaps are. Yeah, fantastic. It's all been anecdotal up to now. Yeah, um, I don't know whether you guys have scanned the chat, but we've got some very interesting backgrounds. Um, journalism, business banking, speech therapy. <laughs> Jason, 24 years ago, was in fashion retail. That's quite funny. Hairdressing, reception, personal training, cabin crew. Yep. <laughs> it's just, uh, it, it kind of proves the the point um around uh, career transition so thanks for sharing guys online matt i've got a couple of tech questions i'm going to pose to you um we so the strategy um needs data and it needs currency of data and one of the things that tq um has kind of found when we've seen companies who are embarking on this is that um you know if the profiles are up to date or mm -hmm. the data is too poor the kind of strategy is stymied um, uh, before it really, really gets going. So, you know, how, how can we overcome that issue, particularly uh, around the, the, the richness of the data that we require? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I think it, it goes almost a step beyond that as well, right? So not just about the richness of data, there's, there's a few ways that that's relatively easily solved, I think, in today's age, which is around connecting data to enhance it. Right. So, you know, if somebody has got a CV and it's a little bit outdated, for example, you know, putting that into something like Beamery, you're able to then check at, you know, 100 plus publicly available data sources like GitHub and LinkedIn and all these other components to augment and update that information. So it's no longer dusty. If you think, you know, all the information that sits in talent pools and ATS systems, businesses spend a fortune on advertising, whether it's career sites whether it's job ads, whether it's using agencies, they spend a lot of money. And I would, I would bet my last dollar an enormous number of those candidates they get that they pay for was already known to them. It just might be data that's just old, unsearchable, inaccurate. So I think there's a lot of importance that goes into being able to search for those people, having that information updated. I think the other one, though, is around the process that sits behind it, right? So having great data is fine. Right. It's a really important part of this journey, becoming skills, you know, creating a skills based transformation relies on data. Absolutely. Connecting different data sources and being able to use that is incredibly important. 
but knowing how to use that, I think is is absolutely mission critical. Um, I think sometimes organizations can look at tech like the silver bullet, right? They can look at tech like, you know, the godsend that's going to mean that they can put their feet up for eight hours a day and they're going to yeah. achieve on their numbers and it's just going to be a breeze. I, there's no replacement for hard work and and really conscious sort of thought processes, right? And I think if you look at how HR data, yes, it's been dusty. Yes, it's been mismanaged. And I think that's a relatively simple fix. I think what to do once it's good is really important, right? I think it's critical for businesses, for partners like yourself, Gareth, for clients, yourself, Claudine. Um, and this is where you and I have worked really well together is that all parties need to come together and communicate frequently. It's where most projects fail. And it's things like having new technology, but using old outdated processes or lack of journey design work. Like who in the business takes ownership for what part of that process? Um, bad internal comms. So once it's all up to date, no one knows what it is or how to use it or why they're using it in that particular way. Um, and probably most important at all, of all rather, I think is the top down leadership on this. People need to know why they're doing this, right? If you're changing a your process, whether you're a recruiter or an HR individual or an employee, if somebody says, hey, fill out this profile on yourself and you just think, I don't have time for that. I've got lots of other things to do today. They have to know the value of mm. why they're being asked to do these things. And I think that ultimately helps drive the business in a singular direction. Um, and in doing that, reduces the risk of the project going wrong, reduces the amount of time it's going to take for it to get really you know, returning a lot of that investment. Um, and ultimately, I mean, this is the key for any transformation. It requires people to transform something, having the raw ingredients, whether that be technology and data on its own, doesn't do that. Yeah, look, and, and um, to, to this point, uh, Alistair on my team uses this slide quite a bit with customers. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks, Lucy, for putting this up. Uh, and you'll see here, you know, successful adoption. You know, these are pretty arbitrary numbers, but it kind of gets the point across. Technology is actually only 10% of the, of the answer, um, the process and the journey and the change and the communication. And importantly, as to, as to your point, Matt, the mindset of leaders, the behaviors of, of users, that's, that is the key to success. And we often see huge underinvestment in that change and comms piece um, when new technology is brought in, which, which Stein is um, obviously its success. So mm -hmm. anyway, th thank you for, for uh, that response. I am going to stick with you, Matt, because um, and and Lucy, can you flash up the second slide, please, when we we go through this question? Um, the HR tech landscape is getting increasingly complex, and um, in order for you, you already talked about it earlier, the the interconnectedness of different technologies and systems. It, it, are we going to see the end of the single ERP or core system? Uh, are we going to see more? need to focus on the purposeful design of that talent tech ecosystem um what's your view on that or, or are the big guys the oracles the success factors and the and the work day is going to uh catch up with some of the best in breeds yeah look it's interesting i mean like i worked for you know for success factors and i, I worked for part of that and i think there's always going to be a place in the world for something that covers everything right or, or the majority of everything um but I think over time, as you see the big HR tech monoliths, right, they've, they've gotten so large that it's just hard to be super cutting edge and innovative of everything they do, right? And that's across the board. You know, it's not SAP or Oracle or Workday. It's, it's everyone. And startups have seen this as a huge opportunity to come in and solve really specific issues for HR that's causing them pain. Um it's a super crowded space in HR tech, right? I mean, as you, as you noted, Gareth, right? It's a busy space. There's a lot of things out there, but it's still growing really, really quickly, right? There's new startups, there's new conversations happening every week, it seems. And it tells me that there's a lot of unsolved if issues still in HR, right? They haven't found that one thing that solves all their problems. Um, and I would agree with that. I think there's always so many different opportunities for organizations that are unique, countries that are unique, employees or, or specific tasks that are, are very specific. Um, and people are still one of those biggest expenditures for a business, 
Mm -hmm. right? They're a finite resource. Everyone's competing for them. And people are really complex to understand at that granular level, coming back to that skills piece that we spoke of earlier. You know, there's still an extra layer that you can go beyond that, which is around the behavior and the sentiment and the, you know, the emotional drivers rather than the, the binary skills. It's more the analog of the person. Um, but I do think that the biggest win for HR has been interoperability of information. So as you pointed out, and I think historically that wasn't possible. Data was sat in an on-premise solution. It wasn't easy to get information out. It wasn't easy to put information back in. Um, and if you look at, you know, cloud, if you look at hosted or private clouds, if you look at AI and all these other things that are able to make sense of information, you don't need that big monolith anymore. You don't need to lock yourself into something. Um, and it's, probably a smarter decision to go best of breed right ultimately it becomes less risky you don't have all your eggs in one basket um data flow doesn't seem to be an issue anymore it's really easy to get information in and out and you get the best of everything that you can switch on and off as your business needs um so i think for a lot of businesses best of breed is the way to go but i don't think we're going to start seeing the the, the reduction or the loss of the uh, the workdays oracles and saps anytime soon <laughs> very uh very tactful um so we, we 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 tend to talk about this data and compliance layer which we see is the big three systems um and then what we're seeing more and more is companies layering on top of that the intelligence layer or the experience layer and mm -hmm. then the various plugins and tools underneath and that just then really talks to the importance of integration data flow understanding the strategy of the ecosystem um, but so uh, yeah, it's increasingly complex, and I agree. I don't think any of those three systems will um, will be able to meet the needs of the businesses. But anyway, that's a, that's a, that's a topic for another day. Claudine, I'd, I'd like to switch tack uh, and come back to you. Um, there's a really scary stat that um, you guys shared with me last week, and I hadn't seen it. So it was World Economic Forum. Um, you know, by 2025, 50 percent of workers are going to require reskilling. Um, that's a very scary number. <laughs> that's a really scary number if it's in any way true. Um, we obviously have been reskilling workers historically, um, but nowhere near at the scale. Um, you, you know, how, how how is the skill strategy going to change what companies are doing, Claudine? And great is it going to allow them to skill reskill at that scale? A great question. And I don't think this is a a new kind of point for us to really consider. I think what has changed, and that is a scary stat, but again, I think that there is one, I don't think we actually know the scale of the challenge because we don't know really the skills that people have. Nobody has really started to pull this together at a real macro level. But I think one of the things that I really believe in, and I think we, we're in this day and age now where technology is everywhere. If we think about what's on our phones, personalization is key right if I think about myself I want you you know if I think about even from a retail perspective you know the the apps that I love are the ones that serve me up with relevant content relevant information and I think that this is the point around learning and development as well previously it really has been that one size fits all right I'm going to put a ton of people through this training program and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. We know, even from a marketing perspective, spray and pray does not work, right? You've got to be hyper-targeted. You've got to be segmented. And so really, this is where this kind of symbiotic relationship comes about. One, understanding what the training needs are, but two, then understanding desires and needs from an employee as well. So you're getting the right people through the right training at the right time. But the benefit to the business then really is around cost. Because if we are being much more targeted and you are helping people reach their their development potential, because this is all around lifelong lifelong learning now for people and the career path that they choose. The benefit is that you're not going to lose people to other companies when you've invested in them so heavily anyway, because you're giving them the right training at the right time for the right job that meets the company's needs and the person's needs as well. Yeah, fantastic. It's interesting. I was uh, reading something Burson put out last week about um, the need for HR to start thinking about products and not programs mm. and think like a product manager to speed up the delivery of HR services rather than building these monolithic programs that take years and then don't meet the needs. So it's, it's a really interesting concept. Um, and I think this 
this topic uh, feeds into that strategy, which is really great. I've got another question for the chat, which I'm going to ask both of you, actually. Uh, Claudine, I will I'll start with you to keep, keep going on that trend. But the question for the chat is, in your business, and this is a topic of workforce planning, I'd like to know how mature you think your business is, where one is really immature and we don't really do it, to five, we're awesome at it, and the business and HR are glued together at the hip on it. So very mature. One highly immature, five very mature. Interested to see what the chat um, is on that. So Claudine, workforce planning. Um, have business leaders got the requisite skills and capabilities to do this? Or perhaps is something else holding them back? This is like the, the million dollar question, I think, of today's session. Um, I, I think traditionally we have, everyone's been very reactive, right? And I think that's very much the world that, that we focus on when it comes to talent. Um, I think the, the business are fantastic at focusing on their areas and really understanding how to move the business forward with strategy. But a part of that strategy hasn't necessarily always included talent. And I think that's really where we're now starting to look at. Um, you know, tech is a great example. You know, we have many teams with the same similar skill sets and profiles. How do we start to look across each of that when we're looking at, okay, we're going to develop this new product or this new product? You know, is there an, a, an opportunity to move people around, restructure people in a, in a better way that gives them the growth and development that they want, but also then start to plan in the next 18 months, two, three years, this is where we will be and we need to start growing that talent now. Um, I think it's getting there. You know, I've seen a huge development over the last 12 months internally as to our thinking. You know, so we definitely now have a three year workforce plan, which is fantastic to see. Um, really kind of going down into specifics around locations, etc. So um, there is greater partnership. And I see, you know, we see for a lot from leaders that they're starting to understand that this is integral to, to the future capability of their teams. Um, and I think the onus is also on, I'm going to call it the the kind of the hiring team, because it's bigger than obviously just TA, but to really help educate managers as well. So using things like the insights to help them understand, coming up with that holistic strategy where there's key roles and responsibilities for everyone. If I think about my own kind of team, we're enablers. We can't deliver the goods on everything. And so... For us, it really is about helping them to understand their part in this and how they help build this out for the longer term. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Matt, any observations from the clients that you guys are playing with? Um, where, where, where are most people on that maturity curve? I know, thanks for sharing on the chat. There's a lot of ones and twos, and I think three is the highest. So um, we're looking at that sample of not very many is quite immature. But what are you seeing, Matt? Uh, so in short, mostly twos. Right. Yeah. I think the, the problem comes is when the twos think they're fours. <laughs> um, but I think part of that is that I think the concept of workforce planning has changed. Right. It used to be, you know, CFOs and, and COOs and CEOs looking at job titles, looking at performance metrics and looking at cost. And that's fine. That's going to help you streamline your business in a short term. You can be more profitable. Um, it makes you much less agile, much less flexible as a business, right? You become very reactive. Um, and again, you know, you look at the tech rec, I think a lot of that occurred. Um, it's really important, I think, for CFOs to look at those examples, right? The, the horrible versions of workforce planning, which have been done on those performance metrics. And, you know, there was a story of a, I'm not going to name the large tech company, but when they were looking at reducing quite a large number of their headcount, they said, well, great, we'll just get rid of the, the, the bottom 25% of performers. And someone in HR astutely noted, well, how does that affect tenure? Is it that they're underperforming because they're brand new? And if it is, we've made great strides to re-diversify our employer workforce over the last couple of years. Are we going to start getting huge problems within the DE&I community that sit internally because we haven't thought about the nuance 
We just looked at a metric, right? And skills, I think, is really unlocking a new way of workforce planning for the longer term, right? It's not just, hey, we've got 16 salespeople or product managers or contact center agents. We only need 13. Well, which 13? Is it performance-based or is it that this person has a unique skill set that makes them really valuable to the business that could be redeployed elsewhere, for example? So that's changing big time. I think the second one is, do business leaders have the capability to understand some of that? I think that's growing. It's quickly becoming a topic, right, that C-level individuals are talking about is around skills and how that translates to workforce planning. It's not there yet, but the ones that are doing it are seeing a huge competitive advantage, right? And that's going to start catching on really quickly. Um, do they have the skills to do it? Right. Do they have the data to do it? Do they have the technology? Do they have the change management? Early days. It's definitely happening. And there's some really good examples wider Asia, some great examples in Australia as well. But it's not as common as you know we would like to see it. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. We've got about uh, eight minutes before we um, open up to Q&A. So there's a couple of questions to go I'd like to, to pose. Uh, Claudine, let's, let's think about the talent teams. Um, for, kind of two questions for you. What is their role or not a role in this skills transformation, but and how will it impact the work they do? What are some of your thoughts there? I love this question. So I think I anchoring back on what I said before about enablers. So it's not all on our shoulders, but we're the ones that really help educate the business right now. Um, almost like the guardians of this. And it's something that I know that most TA teams have been doing for the longest time, right? It's that constant battle of, you want this job title, this years of experience, this company, helping them to understand why that doesn't work. Because by nature, a lot of these hiring managers, they want success. Hiring is quite a scary task to go through. It's super time consuming. You're never quite sure that, you know, is, it, is the person going to work out or not? So there's a lot of emotional investment and pressure from those hiring managers. So they they almost rinse and repeat. We do what we know works. And so really for us now going in and tackling it a different way. So those talent insights, super critical. The other thing is around with those talent insights, helping them to understand when they're looking for an absolute unicorn that doesn't exist. So there's nothing worse. We've all seen it, you know, in, in, in multiple platforms, those job descriptions that's chapter and verse, a million different skills that they're looking for. Require, they just don't even exist. So being realistic around what is the ask and then really what are the top even three skills that you're looking for for this person to do and helping them to understand how that then opens up a kind of a wealth of talent mm. for you to, to kind of bring in. I think the other aspect is really then not only those talent insights, but helping them to understand things like the DEI landscape. So by kind of having that methodology up front, we've started to see much more DNI coming through within the talent pool. So, you know, we really, we want to be more inclusive. You know, as a, a Southeast Asian company, we want to be representative of everyone. And so to do that, you have to think differently. So it's really going back to that, what's in it for me. W one, we enable them but it's really helping the hiring team to understand the what's in it for me. And that for me is the job of the TA. So it's much less nowadays around recruiting. I'm just going to keep pushing people through a funnel mm. for you to do and much more around being a real strategic business partner to them to help them understand the data, make sense of it, and then look at ways that we can then partner with L and D and then uh, HR business partners to make sure that we're upskilling people in the right way. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that, Claudine. There was actually a question in the Q&A from, and, and apologies if I mispronounced the name, I think it's Tinai, uh, um, on this topic. So you've you've actually covered um, uh, a, lot, a lot about that in terms of how this will help with inclusive hiring. Uh, and, and actually, I think, um, I know the ATC, and in particular Trevor, um, has been pushing this notion of talent advisory for a number of months now which is what you're just describing. It's our role is not to order take, it is to advise and to challenge and to uh, educate. And that does need a different set of skills and tools, 
um, but I think is a is is a critical role for the talent function to have um, as we move into this new world. So thank thank you for that, and um, uh, good good that you preempted that question. Um, Matt, we caught up I know a week or so ago, and we talked about you know purposeful design of the hiring and career development experience, and mm -hmm. we we you had this really interesting uh, uh, notion and 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 phrase around humans i.e. talent acquisition professionals need to focus on high quality human interaction let the tech do what it's good at can you can you just bring that to life a little bit more um you know what are some of those things you think in in hiring and career development talent professionals need to be good at and where they should be focused on that aren't going to get automated in the future yeah and i really enjoyed that chat by the way I tried talking to my wife about it afterwards and she sort of glazed over. She was not interested at all. I was being a bit nerdy out with HR. Um, so if I look at talent professionals in general, HR in general, right? Unlike finance and operations, they've been really cautious about over-deploying AI. Um, and I think rightly so, but not for the right reasons. I think they're cautious that they're going to lose their jobs. And I disagree with that, right? I I don't think that there is ever going to be a world where the human resources function is fully automatable. Um, but I also think that HR needs to stop trying to compete with AI. So you will see a lot of times where HR will do things that people are terrible at, that AIs are great at, right? Um, brilliant at speed, accuracy, compliance, data entry, gathering information from all over the place, right? Lots of scale. Humans are awful at that, right? We'll get it wrong. It'll take us ages. We'll get bored halfway through. Um, but but luckily for us, there's a load of stuff that AI is just god awful at as well. And I think what we need to do is understand in that talent journey or in the HR journey in general, which bits need to be overhumanized and which bits need to be fully automated. And then there's probably going to be a number of them which you know there's a hybrid and. Um, that sit between both. But I think getting that balance right and thinking and being cognizant about which points where is really important. Because I think as a business, if you said, hey, um, we're going to automate all of our interviewing. From a business perspective, you're like, that's bloody brilliant. You know, we don't have to spend hours and hours a day doing it and we can really ramp it up to scale to interview hundreds of thousands of people in a week. Brilliant. Um, I could see Claudine shaking her head, right? I mean, an employer brander would just stabbed to the heart it's it's a horrible idea it doesn't build loyalty and it doesn't build the sort of affection that you want and if you look at high drop-off rates for interviews or low acceptance rates etc it's often about people not feeling that connectivity to the mission of the company connectivity to the people that are in the company and not really understanding what their purpose would be there and what that future would look like and i think hiring needs to be human mm. i think we need to look at you know, which points we over double down on being human and which points we, you know, automate, you know, when someone's getting rejected for a job interview, you know, going for an interview is a scary thing. It takes a lot of bravery to leave one job or maybe you're unemployed and you really needed a job. Um, getting an automated email to say, hey, sorry, you're not a good fit after your third email must just be confusing, right? And it's going to put you off ever applying for that job again or that company again. It's going to help you spread that message out. And I think it's very easy to undo a lot of great employer brand work by overdoing it in AI or overdoing it in automation at least. Yeah, interesting. No, great point. I mean, yeah, we, we talk about those critical moments that matter in the journey and you've got to work out, is that is that something tech is delivering or is that something a human is delivering? Um, and then if if human who and what skills do they need? Um, and that, that that's the purposeful design piece. So I think it's... It's a bit that a lot of companies are uh, grappling with at the moment. Um, it's 10 to 12. We've still got a fair few people on the webinar, which is great. So thanks for hanging the uh, crew online. Um, I think we will may just pick up a couple of questions uh, rather than me um, ask my last couple. Craig Wood asked an interesting question. Um, thanks for the question, Craig. Um, I'll paraphrase. Um, they're, they're on a journey at Uniting, but... Do, do they need a um, competency library? Do they need a, um, a, a a rigorous job family framework? From an infrastructure point of view, is that critical to embark on this? Um, or can, in some cases, can you adopt the vendor taxonomy or the vendor-led solution? 
And I may ask that of you first, Matt. Um, so it's a good question, right? And I think it depends on the use case. Now, this is where I'm going to do a shameless plug of Beamery. Um, so, <laughs> so we can take in skills taxonomies. You can use ours. It can be a hybrid of the two. Um, you know, you can use Workday or success factors and consulting ones that you've built and bring it into Beamery and Beamery can update that and augment it. Um, that's from Beamery's perspective. More broadly, I think it really depends on how old and how outdated the taxonomy is. And I think how niche the skills are that sit within your business, right? So you mentioned something like uniting. So, you know, on the, on the care side, um, lots of really niche skills there, right? It's not like banking where it's really binary. There's a lot of soft skills that are required. There's a lot of legal certifications that are involved. Um, so I think in that instance, the more the better, because it's going to help provide directionality and accuracy. So bringing different skills taxonomies or ontologies together, um, job architectures, for example, updating them and having them unified, I think is probably the best bet there. Yeah, fantastic. It's interesting, actually, because um, uh, we had a customer who, during their RFP process, they worked out the squad of consultants they had from one of the big four firms who who was building this um, competency and skills um, uh, library for them wouldn't be needed moving forward because the technology was just constantly updating their entire mm -hmm. um, skill-based library um, automatically with external data and internal data. And they, they had this aha moments of dropping what was probably millions of dollars of consulting spend um, because of the tech coming in, which is which is interesting. Um, this is a question I may flip to you, Claudine. Uh, it's quite I think it could be quite relevant for for Grab. Uh, Zoe asked a question about non-employees, so those who are working in less traditional ways, like gig workers, contractors, etc. Do we include those folk in this strategy? What's what's the view there? Well, I, I'm I'm not an employment law specialist, so whatever I say right now, take with a pinch of salt. Um, what I would say is this is where we come back to total talent, right? And I think it's obviously our employees are our employees, and they'll be going through perhaps more of an internal uh, pathway and journey with us when we think about skills and talent and how we then develop them. That said, when we're then thinking about the external side really the contractors and gig workers should be showing up in there and you know why we whilst we won't necessarily be developing them what we will start to see is where is that there that ability to bring them in and convert them if we need to which is quite often what we don't do but there is a bigger issue right in terms of and this goes back to the workforce planning so one of the things that we saw over time is when you looked at a particular skill that we know is very much needed uh, in the company, we had a lot of contractors doing that type of job that actually it would have been far cheaper and easier to convert one full-time headcount and have them dedicated. So really having that, that overall view in terms of workforce planning, understanding the skills will help us understand everything. And yes, you have to include gig workers and contracts in that workforce planning piece. But in terms of total talent view and skills development, slightly separate. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and I think there's an argument as well in many companies to include your pipeline of talent who is not even deployed or haven't been. I mean, I'm thinking of some of the um, consulting businesses who are pitching for work on a global scale to be able to show what their ecosystem of talent looks like, whether they're per um, contingent pipeline, I think is uber powerful and actually um, helps them win more work. Um, so, no, fa fantastic. And um, question from, uh, hey, Michelle, nice to see you from New Zealand. Um, great that you, you've uh, dialed in. Thanks for the question. Um, I mean, Matt, you talked about companies laying off people, uh, quite, you know, 25% layoffs and, and so forth in the tech rack. Have you seen any company having a bit of a light bulb moment and, and actually instead of doing that, has actually opted for redeployment? upskilling instead I've, I've got one i'm thinking of but have you seen any in the global beamery network that's doing that totally look I, I don't think it's it's not either or right if you're having to reduce thousands of headcount it's going to be very difficult to redeploy thousands of people and i don't think it's something that you can do rep, like 
um, retroactively. I don't think it's something that you can do as a knee-jerk reaction. Redeploying needs to be planned, whereas mass layoffs usually come as a result of not having planned. Um, so what you want to start moving away from is instead of building, 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 getting rid of people and then sort of continuing on that cycle, it's more about sort of growing more thoughtfully with the people that you have in your business so that you don't have to reduce your headcount by thousands of people. So the answer is yes on both counts, right? I mean, it's still it's still going to happen. You're still going to have to make redundancies based on macro conditions that you can't see. Yeah. Um, but what what we want to see, I think what is a best practice in this space is that the ratio changes from redeploying 20% and losing 80% of those people to the other way around, that you're redeploying the 80% continuously. And then as a macro condition pops up, that's when you would need to retrench, but a much smaller amount. Yeah, it's interesting. One, the the one I won't mention the brand, but there's one of our big banks that's gone through this. Um, so in some of their uh, core banking areas where they were laying off lots of, or going to lay off lots of people through um, uh, digital uh, digitization of the work, they actually have basically identified people with requisite skills to move into areas like data and analytics. Um, and upskilled those people, which has led to literally hundreds of people being retained in the business, as opposed to, you know, 10 years ago, they would have probably just all been sacked. Um, so uh, anyway, it's, it's one, one example. Okay, Ruth, thank you all for staying online. We've got one, I've got one question, which I will ask Claudine, and you get, you get the last, last, um, last say today. Um, if you're on this journey, you're thinking of going on this journey or your organization's just starting, what's your advice to some of the things they should be thinking about or doing in this Nothing. first phase, in this sort of discovery and uh, 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 an initial thinking phase? You, and you've got two minutes. Okay, I'm going to sum it up. I'm going to try and do it in three points. One, I think, is uh, making sure that there's real business ownership of this, right? It's not something that can just be driven out of HR. Two is then really starting to understand from a strategy perspective where the business is going, align those two. And then the third one, I had it there. The third one is actually in relation, I was going to speak up earlier to the technology point and around, um, do we need taxonomy? I am going to say from personal experience, we in HR have the ability to over-engineer and over-complicate certain pieces as well. Um, and that's what takes us a long time to then, one, develop and then execute. Mm. So thinking much more like a product team, going back to your point earlier, yeah. like let's try, you know, start small and then grow it from there. Get the adoption in um, rather than waiting three years to execute something permanently and or perfectly which never is fantastic well um there's a fair number of you that held on for the hour so thank you to the 44 participants that are still online um i'd just like to say firstly thank you to the atc for hosting uh secondly matt claudine uh wonderful to spend a bit of time with you today talking about this super important topic and uh, i hope the guys on the online you've enjoyed the discussion Feel free to connect with any of us if you want to discuss this further. I know everyone will be happy to connect uh, on LinkedIn and similar. Um, so thank you all and have a have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.